So I, I felt the Lord come into this place. Thank you, Jesus. He's amazing God. Jesus. So if we can turn to Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 19. Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 19. And it says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto loose those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if any think ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing, brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so you are, so as ye have, as for an example. And leave it right there just for a minute. Thank you, Jesus. Sister Walson, would you please pray? Jesus, Lord, in Jesus' name, you see us, Lord, how we need you, Lord. You see every heart, O oh God, that's here. And I ask you to anoint your servant, O oh God. Let her say those things that will draw us close to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So I'm going to talk to you today about a stumbling block or a stepping stone. A stumbling block or a stepping stone. The Lord said, the Bible tells us to walk so that we are an example to others. Are we walking in a way that if others look at us, they know that we are walking for Christ? Do they see Christ in us? Do they know? Do we tell them, oh, we shouldn't do these things, but then we turn around and do them? Are we being an, an, an example? Are we being a stumbling block? And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Maybe. I tell you, this stupid iPad, it just blinks off. Maybe Brother Tim can look at it and help me with it. It says for chapter 18, For as many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who minded earthly things. So are we walking after God? Do we want his ways? Or are we wanting to walk our own path but think that we are walking his ways? Think about that. When we come in to serve God, we're serving him. We're walking a path. We're walking, hopefully, so that people behind us can see and can follow. Yes, that's right. That's what an example is. But there are some people who just want to serve him in church, and then they go out and live like the devil, and then they come back to church, and they want to worship, and then they go out and live like the devil. They're only fooling themselves. They're not fooling the people in the world, because when they look at them, they're like, huh, what a hypocrite. They know what a hypocrite is. Right. They know if you're living for God or not. You know, there's this something that's going around on the on the Facebook. It says something about, you know, I know if you're lying to me. I know if you're a true friend or not. Uh, you can keep talking and I'll pretend that you're my friend. But I'm not fooled. Well, the same thing goes for a Christian. You can tell people you're living for God all you want. You can go out, come to church, speak in tongues, run the aisles, and then go out and live like the devil, and then Wednesday come and run the church and speak in tongues, and then go home and live like the devil. Who are you fooling? Yourself. You're not fooling God. You're certainly not fooling the devil. The devil's down there clapping. He's excited. Woo-hoo! Go girl! Go boy! You're not fooling anybody but yourself. And in the end, when Jesus Christ comes, and we go up to meet him, and you have all these silly excuses of why you couldn't serve him, have you really fooled him? You know, I preached the last service that God sees everything that you're doing. 
to. He can see what I'm doing here in America at this very moment, and he can see what somebody across the world in China is doing at this very moment. It's day here, it's night there, but he still sees it, and he knows. Oh my goodness. <coughs> he knows what you're doing. Pastor Watson preached on being on the straight and narrow gate. Wide is the way to destruction, and narrow is the way to salvation, and few there be to find it. Right. Quite truthfully, I don't understand. I don't understand. You know you have a short span. You have a short lifespan. Even if you live to 97, like my little grandmother, hopefully will live to 97. She turns 97 in October. She still had a short life compared to eternity. That's right. <clears throat> that is like a blink in God's eyes. If a thousand years is one day in God, and eternity is immeasurable in God, where do you want to spend that? Do you want to keep fooling yourself here and saying you're okay? And then go meet the Lord. You know, I've heard it preached. I'd rather have a, 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 a truckload of too much of God. I'd rather live for God a truckload more. In other words, I'd, I'd rather have more rules than, than you can count in a fishbowl or, or the sea, sands of the sea and make it to heaven. Or try to edge myself by and live on the fence and, and, and try to and, and get up to heaven and he says, oh, one thing thou art lacking. One thing you're lacking. And that thing is going to take you to hell. You know, you've got a thimble, but a, a two less, you might as well say. You've got a spoonful of medicine, too little to make it. I don't want to try to slide in by the seat of my pants. Right. I don't. I want to know for a surety that if I walk out there and I get hit by a truck today, then I'm, 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 I'm ready to meet the Lord. You know, I used to ride this little scooter around. They had this thing on the internet that, on, on Facebook. Did you see it? Where this little scooter's in front of this big truck. And they're in traffic rush. And they start going and the big truck behind her runs her over. You see her, she she's trying, and, it, and, and the truck goes right over. And then the truck comes out on the other side. Her little scooter is obliterated. She's trying to scoot out of the way because she's got a broken foot where the truck ran over it. Horns are tooted. And it's like in a big city, you know, in four lane, eight lanes of traffic. And she's over here next to the wall. And she's having to crawl across the interstate to, <laughs> to safety. You know? And some of us, you know, that's, what, that's how we live here. We're riding a scooter in front of a Big Mac truck, and we're in a blind spot. And we're hoping, we're hoping that, that we're going to make it, that that truck's going to realize we're there when we're in a blind spot. But you see, she was in a blind spot. That truck was looking out over at the cars. He didn't see that tiny little scooter that was right smack in front of him. And sometimes we're doing that. We are right smack in front of destruction in a blind spot and we think we're going to get by we're going to get by with it we're going to miss the truck running over us thank goodness um she made it she was like right in the middle of the tires you know her scooter didn't make it and her foot didn't make it but she made it right but we don't have that that knowledge if we're trying to inch by, if we're trying to make it just by inching. 19 said, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Who mind earthly things? Are we living for ourselves or are we living for God? There's a story of an actor 
Um, in the Ozarks and Branson City, Missouri, they used to have the Passion Play. I've been there, I've seen it. It's a huge play. They've got like, I don't know, three or four hundred actors. It's outside. Uh, it, it displays, you know, Jesus being Pilate and being, being hung on the cross between the, I mean, it was really awesome. I don't think they have it now. But there's a story that the, they hired this actor to play Jesus. And he's walking down through the, uh, carrying his cross. And somebody starts heckling him and, you know, making fun of him and whatever. And the actor finally gets mad, throws the cross down, goes and punches the guy, goes back, picks up the cross, and keeps going. And, you know, so the, the guy over the play calls him and says, you can't do that. You're betraying Jesus. You can't stop in the middle of this play and go punch somebody and then go hang on the cross and die for people's sins and whatever. You can't do that. So the actor says, okay, okay. So the next night, he's got his cross. And he's going down. And there's that guy. And he starts heckling him again, worse than before. And he's like, grit his teeth. He finally can't stand it. He throws the cross down. He goes and he punches the guy. So they call him and they say, okay, you're fired. We just can't have a Jesus that's going around in the crowd punching people. You do understand that, right? We can't have a guy portraying Jesus and punching people. So he says, oh, please give me another chance. Give me another. So they say, we got one more chance. So next time he's out, he gets his cross. He's walking down. <laughs> and there's this guy. And he's even worse than the night before. Finally, the guy goes over and he says, I will deal with you after the resurrection. And he keeps going. <laughs> I'll deal with you after the resurrection. <laughs> but you know, <it's, laughs> people know how Jesus is supposed to act, right? And a Christian, as Christians, we're supposed to live like that. We're supposed to live. We're supposed to be Christ-like. That's why we're called Christian. Can we turn to 2 Corinthians 5.20? It says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. Do you know what an ambassador is? You know what an ambassador? I mean, we've got ambassadors from China. We've got ambassadors from Taiwan, all of that. In our cities, they, we got great big, what, what are they called? Um, embassies. Embassies. And when you step on that embassy, you're no longer on American soil. You're on the Chinese soil. Or you're on Taiwan soil. Or, you know, whatever country that that's portraying, <clears throat> when you walk in the gate, <clears throat> you are now on their soil. Same thing with us. We have American embassies over in these countries in Australia and whatever. And if you're ever in trouble, you're told, run to the embassy. Because when you get into the side of the embassy, you're okay because you're now on American soil. So an ambassador is the one who runs that. And when an ambassador walks out into these countries, they are portraying their country. So... They want them to live correctly. They want them to be politically correct and treat people the way they want their country to be recognized. And if an ambassador steps out and does something horrible, heaven forbid they do this, it makes the news, it's a big splash everywhere. The ambassador sent home in shame. That country is shamed because their ambassador was acting in a way that was unbecoming of them. And the Bible says that we are an ambassador. To who? To Christ. We are an ambassador. When we walk out the door, we are representing Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. That's who we are. And are we living our life in a way that's becoming to him. If he looks down, is he going to say, oh wow, look at my ambassador go. I am so proud of them. Or hide his head in shame and say, oh, there they go again. You think about it. You have an extremely important responsibility.
responsibility to live your life in such a way as to bring glory and honor to the one who has chosen you to represent him in the world. As Christians, we are personally responsible for Christian influence. Each and every one of us is a model of Christianity. You are either a good model or you are a bad model. Jesus gives us a warning in Mark 9, 42-44. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that has a millstone were hanged about his nut, and he was cast into the sea. In the days of Jesus, there was a small millstone where a woman could grind, you know, with this little thing, and she would sit and grind her mill. And then there was a big millstone. And this millstone was uh, in the center, and it had poles sticking out, and they put, like, mules or oxen or whatever on these poles, and the ox would go around, and as they went around, it would grind the mill. And the Lord's not talking about the tiny little millstone that, to hang around your neck. No, he says it's better to have that huge millstone that one person cannot move unless you're Samson. Put around your neck and thrown into the depths of the sea than to offend one little one. And who's his little ones? Us. Me. Us. And, by the way, the new converts. Every single one of us. Right. First Chronicles 16, 20, 22. And when they went from nation to nation and from one kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sakes. And it's talking about us. His people, when they went out, he told them, you will be received, and if you're not received, knock your shoes together, knock off the dust and go on, and I'm going to bring judgment on them. But if they welcome you, if they welcome you into their midst and they welcome you, then I will pour blessings on our household. That's when he told them to go out and preach. He said, don't worry about the clothes on the back of you, your back. Don't worry about the food you're going to eat. Right? And he says, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Who's his anointed? We're all anointed if we have the Holy Ghost, but his prophets, his ministers. Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. You better be careful when you're dealing with God's people and when you're dealing with God's ministers. Don't run around talking about them all over town. If you don't agree with something, you go into their office and you ask them, what did you mean by this? And you get some teaching. Because God's going to judge you for that. He's going to judge you. Don't run around talking about your brothers and sisters in the church. If there's a problem, go to the preacher. Let the preacher, preacher handle it, and you pray and fast for the people and for the preacher to give them wisdom. God's not waking you up at 5 in the morning, is he? 3 in the morning, 2 in the morning? I don't think so, but he's waking me up. Why? Because I am the prophet. I now stand in place of God. God takes it serious. Some young men and were making fun of one of the prophets and bears came out and ate them. Be respectful. If you have a problem with me, come to me and talk to me about it. Talk to God about it. Talk to the bishop. You're more than welcome to go and run your mouth to her. This is the two prophets we got, me and her. Amen. This is who you've got. This is who the Lord's put over this church. Amen. You don't like what I'm saying? Go to her. If you don't like what she's saying, go to me. And we'll sort it out. But God is wanting to bring revival. He's wanting to bring revival. And he can't do it with all this. And one more thing. Don't you dare tell a new convert that they're sinning 
it for doing anything. That's my job. That's the pastor's job. Leave it alone. They ask you a question, and it's something you shouldn't answer. You say, oh, well, that's a good question. Go talk to the pastor about that. Ronnie Ann knows that line quite well, because I used it on her many times. <laughs> Why? I wasn't the pastor, and I wasn't going to go there. Because if I offend a little one, I'm going to get a millstone around my neck. It was not for me to talk to them. I was not going to offend them. It wasn't up to me. And believe me, when they're ready to hear it, God will tell them. But I remember several of you, many of you came for a year or so doing things that wasn't right. But you were allowed to grow. You was allowed to come and worship and grow and get to the place where you could take sound doctrine. And unfortunately, today, it's even worse than it was before because nobody wants to hear that. So they have to get into an anointed servant sir, uh, service where the sermon goes forth, where they feel the tug on their heart, and where God starts talking to them, and then they'll go and they'll talk to the preacher, or they'll talk to you, and again, direct them to the preacher. Amen. Too many people are run out the door because we take it upon ourselves to pastor. We take it upon ourselves, the pastor. Philippians 3, 18 through 19. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, and even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, and who mind earthly things. He weeps. He calls you enemies of Christ. If you were putting your fleshly self above his kingdom, he calls you an enemy. That's not going to bode well for you when you come up before his throne. No. If he's calling you an enemy already, that's not going to bode well with you. He's not saying you don't need to, to watch, you know, you know, go and work because you need food and, and put food on the table and do what you need to do to take care. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about, oh, I don't feel like going to church today. Uh, there's a big game on I want to watch. I'm going to stay home and watch this game. And, and I'm going to have a football party. And, you know, I'm just giving you one illustration. There's many. Oh, my favorite show comes on on Wednesdays. I can't go because I, well, I can't miss this show. Oh, you know, I'm going to have family over. We're going to have supper, and uh, we're going to go to the, the circus or whatever. So, you know, I'm sure you don't mind if I don't come to church. Well, once or twice during the year, yes, take a vacation. Take a vacation. But if it's on a constant basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, maybe you should examine yourself. Everybody needs a vacation. Everybody needs to get away. I understand that. If you want to go to Florida and go to Disney World, and you're not going to be here for two weeks or whatever. I understand that. That's a vacation. If it was me, I'd be finding a church to go at least once while I'm out there on my vacation. I'd be visiting a church because it's fun. You know, you get to meet new people and see new things. But I leave that up to you. Vacation is vacation. I don't want to be called. Okay, so for me to profess to be a Christian and to live my life in a way that contradicts my profession of faith makes me an enemy of the cross. It means my poor example is doing more harm than good. It means my life is turning people away from Christ rather than people towards Christ. For me to talk about love and hate my brother or sister in Christ makes me an enemy of the cross. For me to talk about moral living, but then to live in immorality makes me an enemy of the cross. For me to praise God on Sunday morning, but cuss like a sailor and tell filthy jokes during the week makes me an enemy of the cross. 
For me to preach one thing and practice another makes me an enemy of the cross. And for me to go from house to cause, house gossiping and telling tales makes me an enemy of the cross. Do you understand the concept of this? Yes. Proverbs 16.28 says, A perverse man sows strife, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. You do this, you're going to sow strife, and you're going to lose your friends. They're only going to listen to you for a little bit, and then they're going to roll their eyes and say, Oh my goodness, here comes so-and-so. All they're going to do is talk about my problems, their problems, everybody else's problems. I'm happy with problems. I don't want them over to my house anymore. Huh? We've all been there. We've all seen the phone calls that, oh, no, not home. <laughs> We've all been there. Yeah, you know, sometimes you've got to unload and your friend listens. But it shouldn't be 24-7. Sometimes you need to take some of this to the pastor and to God and pray about it. And fast about it. Right? <coughs> 1 Peter 4, 15, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Woo, <laughs> that's pretty strong. I'm going to get to good stuff in a minute. Ephesians 4, 11, 14 says, and he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for what? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Come to me with these kind of problems. We'll deal with it. We'll pray and we'll fast. That's not called gossiping. But if you're going to everybody's house in the neighborhood, you're calling everybody up, you're putting it all on Facebook, mm. then what are you doing? You're gossiping and you're causing strife and you could cause somebody to lose their soul. God gave pastors an anointing preaching to perfect the saints, not you. It is never all right to take it on yourselves to instruct someone else on sin or how to live. You can live by an example if they ask and you say, well, you know, I, I love Christ and I'm serving God. And if they want a Bible study, well, you know, I'll talk to my pastor. Maybe we can go together and, and we'll, we'll give you a Bible study, that type of thing, right? So we've established a stumbly block, block is an enemy of the cross. Is driven by our flesh, the appetites. And one more, its stumbling block is focused on the things of the world. If we have our mind on earthly things, we're going to be so preoccupied with the world that we're going to neglect our most spiritual things. When's the last time that you prayed? And you read your Bible, and you did your hour of devotions. I don't want anybody to raise my, your hand. <laughs> but how many hours have you done playing a game? Going to the park. Going out to eat. Doing all these things. But you can't spend one hour with God. What's running your life? We're all guilty of it. I know I've been guilty of it. That's our strength. If we're praying and we're reading our Bible every day, we're getting our strength so that we can get up and we can go out of the house and we can live for God. Because whatever you feed, that's what's going to take over your life. If you're feeding your flesh, you're going to backslide. You're going to start finding fault with everything. Finding fault for it first with the preacher, then with the church, then with the saints. You find fault with everything. Then your friends who's in who's in the church because they're going to be telling you things that you're not going to want to hear. You're on your way out the door. I don't want to see anybody here backslide. I'm 56. I've lived this life, and I can tell you, person after person after person who was once mighty in God who is now not, and the steps to their downfall.
That's the biggest one right there. So if I'm going to be, a, now let's talk about the characteristics of the stepping stone. We're going to get to the good stuff now. If I'm a stepping stone, I must follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Philippians 3.17 says, Brother, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an example. He's admonishing the, the Philippians, the Christians, to follow Paul's example, to follow Paul as a stepping stone. Well, how did Paul become a stepping stone? How did that happen? Well, he followed a pattern. What was the pattern? He followed the way Christ lived on this earth. You think about it. That's what these <coughs> disciples used as an example. They followed Jesus for three years or so. And he showed them how to deal with the people. He showed them how to, to live. He showed them how to preach. He, he showed them everything. He was their example. So that when he was taken out, they could live. And do we not have the same example? Because they wrote it carefully in the scriptures, did they not? Yeah. They wrote. Everything we need to know to live for God is right there. Philippians 1, 18 through 21. What then, notwithstanding every way, whether a pretense or a truth, Christ is preached, and I there do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also, Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be for life or for, or, or for death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's the way we live. We live to, to please Jesus. We live to be an example so others can follow. That is a stepping stone. Titus 2.7 says, In all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing incorruptions, gravity, and sincerity. Uncorruptness. Gravity and sincerity. That doesn't mean you have to go around with a long face all the time. I'm a Christian, so I can't laugh and I can't joke and I can't play games because I'm a Christian. No. What he means is realize in everything you do that Jesus is looking. Go and have fun. We went to Santa's Village. We had a blast. We went, what, last week? You can go have fun. You can go have fun with your family and with your friends. You can go on vacations and whatever. Just remember that God's watching and live for him. You know, some people, they get out of state and they say, oh, well, the preacher's not watching now. The saints aren't watching. I guess I can go do this and I'll be okay. Well, you may. We may not see you, but God sees you. Always live with the knowledge that he's coming and he sees you. He gives you the Holy Ghost. For what? For instruction. Mm. If you're prayed up, if you stay prayed up, no matter what comes your way, you can have peace. Yeah. I know what I'm talking about. I've had some serious, serious things. I've been on my deathbed three times. They said, family called in. You know, here I am dying. Uh, okay, God, am I right with you? Ooh, did I, okay, have I done all my steps? You're on your deathbed. You're going to be thinking about it, right? Because mm -hmm. your next breath could be uh, out of your body and before the throne. And some serious, I've gone through some serious trials. Kristen Lee almost died. She was in the hospital for at least a month after I got out. And I was in the hospital for two or three weeks in intensive care. When I got out, she was in there for four more weeks. They told me that I was going to have to have a monitor because she was going to stop breathing. She was going to be a sudden infant death baby. What does that do? And then we go to pick her up and say, oh, we've decided it's just reflux. She's allergic to milk. And, uh, yeah. I had to trust God. Then I had a little grandson who had blood in his 
year and he was dying. He was dying. I knew it. This first one. Yeah. Kevin was dying too. Don't think that this Nana didn't go on her knees and pray and fast for my grandbabies. I flew to Alaska when I had no money. I changed the ticket. I begged, borrowed, and stolen almost. <laughs> but not really, because I wanted to go to heaven. But you know what I'm saying? I didn't have the money to go to Alaska. But I had a grandbaby that was dying. But in all of this, I had peace. I had peace. Why did I have peace? Because I knew that I had walked before the Lord with honor, with dignity, with integrity. I knew that I had done my, 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 my homework. You better have your homework done before you get into one of these situations. You better know who you serve before you get into one of these situations. Other things that, you know, it's really my, my children's uh, stories they can tell you. But I was up many a night pleading and begging the Lord for my children. And then when I felt the peace that passes all understanding, I went to bed. You went to bed when you knew they were, yeah, I went to bed. Why? Because I prayed until I felt the peace of the Lord and I knew God was answering and that they were in his hands and then I was able to go to sleep. If you have a walk with God and you travail and then you feel that calm peace come in the room. You can't explain it. It's just a peace. And he says, I've got it. I've got it. It's okay. I got you back. Then you can go to bed and you can go to sleep. I don't care what's happening around you. What about the little lady who had the typhoon? Uh, or the, the great big tidal wave was coming. And they told everybody to get out. And she stood on her steps and said, in Jesus' name. And the water parted. This was in the news. You can look it up. The water parted. Went around her house. Everything else was destroyed but her house. I'd say she had a walk with God. Oh, yeah. I'd say she already had gotten down and done her homework. I'd say she knew who she was serving. Yeah. Otherwise, she wouldn't have been able to stand there like that with that wave coming. No. no it was huge. It was that huge tsunami that destroyed, I don't know, how many people and how many. And her little house was right on the beach. And miles and miles of destruction. And one little house. It made the news. Do you know the God that you serve? Can you really tell me you know him? 